My name is Michael Guyad, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. This will be a really good conversation, folks. This is going to be a busy day for me. I just got back from North Carolina, did the CFA chapter presentations there in Charlotte, Raleigh, and Winston-Salem, catching up to see the world is ending again, uh, apparently, which we're going to talk about with Marco. Joining me for the hour is Mr. Marco Popic. Uh, Marco, I've uh, been checking some of your recent uh, interviews. I'm very impressed with the way you think about the world and the framework that you bring to the table. But introduce yourself here to the audience. Who are you? How did you get involved interested in markets? And what's your main specialty? Super. Well, thank you so much, Michael. My uh, What I do is, uh, is kind of interesting. I mean, I, I sit at the intersection of politics, geopolitics, and policy on one side, and then finance on the other. And the way that I got to this role at the uh, Clock Tower Group, which is an alternative asset management uh, group, we primarily seed macro hedge funds for a living. My role is I'm basically the macro concierge, and I um, sit on top of a team that helps our LPs make sense of the macro environment. So what I do is I ingest a lot of information from conversations with macro managers around the world, both those that are just emerging and those that are very much successful and already established. Uh, and then I also use my sort of proprietary, if you will, framework, which I developed over 10 years on the sell side in political risk, uh, consulting with Stratfor, where I started my career, and then at BCA Research, which is a macroeconomic research firm up in Montreal, Canada. And the framework is really a modified framework on, um, on figuring out where geopolitics is going. Um, it's a constraint-based framework. So what I do is basically I try to figure out where policymakers are going to end up. Uh, what I really focus on is the material constraints that force policymakers into kind of the path of least resistance. And in doing this job, you know, um, you come up with all sorts of things that come that that you have to deal with, whether it's the market implications of something like the Ukraine invasion. That's a very obviously simple case, like Russia invades Ukraine. What does this mean for markets? Uh, to really longer term questions, which most of my institutional investor clients want to know. So they don't necessarily want to know whether oil is going up and down. Over the next three months, they really want to know what's going to happen with asset allocation over a period of like three to seven years, what's going to happen to inflation and growth and those dynamics. And so I, I try to sit in this barbell of um, intellectual thought where sometimes it's very short term and sometimes it's very long term. I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the the seeding of the of the macro hedge funds. What are some of the criteria that you typically look towards that you gravitate towards? And maybe more importantly, what's like a red flag? I mean, everyone, I think, especially on FinTwit, likes to think of themselves as a macro guru, right? I can't imagine, obviously, the types of people that you might come across who have experience you know, are very overconfident, uh, even more so than FinTwit, and think they're phenomenal at identifying these macro trends. What, what are some of the things that you look for and try to avoid? First of all, just to be clear, I'm the macro concierge of the firm. So I really work for the LPs. There's a whole other unit at Clock Tower that actually does this as a, as a professional job where they select the managers that we're going to seed. But I can speak to that because, you know, obviously I've been here for a while. Um, in other words, I'm not a decider, you know. So I think, first of all, you have to ask yourself, do you want the macro hedge fund? You know, so that's, that's the first issue that I think is really important for, for institutional investors. And for a decade, the answer has been no. And so the reason that I think Clock Tower Group is one of the really only macro seeders out there left is that macro hedge funds have fallen out of favor. This sort of single PM discretionary model has, has really fa fallen very much out of favor uh, for most institutional investors. And so, so that's just something to keep in mind. But it's coming back, obviously, because of the volatility that exists and in large part because of the world that I inhabit which is this intersection between geopolitics and markets, it's very difficult to be systematic about that. Um, and I think that that's where single PM discretionary model um, does have its usefulness. In terms of what you're looking for, first of all, it's track record. Even, even when you're looking at an emerging manager who may have only been in a PM role for about a decade or even less, and it's very difficult to get a track record, you know, it might be basically proprietary information of the hedge fund they're currently working on, um, you have to somehow eke it out. And uh, that's a very, very difficult, that's like arcane art of trying to figure out whether the person you're talking to, uh, the person you're trying to seed, truly has the track record that they claim they have. Oftentimes, the hedge fund 
that they work at is not going to share that information. Oftentimes, they have an interest in minimizing that particular PM's role uh, because obviously they um, you know, don't want to say that the person they're losing was critical to their performance. So it's very difficult, but that's the number one thing. The second thing is you want to ensure that they have an intellectual framework that's repeatable. I mean, to be honest with you, this is, this is, this is the most important thing. Do they align on how they view the markets, how they view the world, how they ingest data? Sort of, are, are they, do they have a framework that's logically consistent, ontologically and like epistemologically? You know, like, do, or are they just throwing darts at the wall? Um, and that's probably where I get most involved when I speak to managers we might seed. I'm not trying to figure out if I agree with their view. I mean, that would be really stupid because it's, you know, if, if I could do this, I would just take the 400 million. My job is more just to sit and listen to how their brain works and to see if it's logically consistent. So uh, that they don't flip uh, between reasoning for their trades. You know, sometimes they might be bottom up, sometimes they might be top down. That's probably a bad, uh, a bad look. Um, and then finally, you know, you're looking at things like pedigree, hunger, ambition, but also ability to work with others. So if you think you're just going to be someone who is an asshole, but your performance speaks for the, yourself, you can forget about getting a check. Why? Because you're going to have to work with institutional investors over the course of your career. And you're going to have to be, you know, reasonable. Um, and you can't just, uh, be unreasonable in terms of negotiating terms, negotiating allocation and other things. So these are all the things that come into it. And, you know, before I came into this industry, I was obviously on the sell side, I was writing research. So this has been very much new to me the last five years. Um, and what I'm surprised about, Michael, is how qualitative it is. You know, I thought it was just performance and it's just quantitative. Like, well, this, this person outperforms that person in this situation, the sharp ratio, this and that. But actually, a lot of it has to do with the quality, the, the characteristic and qualities of a human being, which makes a lot of sense because you're not so much investing in their brain, but you're investing in their personality and character as well. You know, and I think that's actually, I agree with that's sort of a um, underappreciated fact of, of thinking about how somebody trades through markets or has an approach when it comes to investing, you can only control performance so much. You have to wait for the cycle to come to you. Going back to your point about macro for the last decade hasn't really been the place to be, but it might be now. And if you're going to build a business, you have to be able to work with others because to your point, it's not just about performance. People do business with people, not just numbers. Well, and that's that's a myth, I think, in finance. You know, there's this myth that you can just be a hard-charging single PM who doesn't care, Bloomberg screens in front of you, uh, let's go, you know, and everybody else can get out of your way. But the problem is that when you're down 10, 20%, and you're going to be down 10, 20%, every successful hedge fund manager has had those moments. Uh, that's when you're going to have uh, to know how to use diplomacy to deal with the LPs and institutional investors in particular. Hedge funds have become an institutional game. And so if you're going to be successful and have a multi-billion dollars worth of AOM, uh, you better have humility as well. And uh, I would say that that's the number one pitfall. In my very short experience monitoring this, um, that's, that's been the number one pitfall of hedge fund managers. Now, my partner and uh, the founder and the CEO of the firm, um, Steve Drobny, who wrote the book on hedge funds, on macro hedge funds in particular, called Inside the House of Money. He did that in the early 2000s. He knows infinitely more about this. You know, I'm really the nerd of the firm. And again, my, my job is to produce research that is largely consumed by institutional investors, also our research clients. And yes, also the macro hedge funds we seed. But with them, my role is a little bit different. Like I don't go in front of a hedge fund managers we seeded and try to convince them of my view because I'm very good at convincing people of my view. And if I convinced all of our hedge funds that we've seeded that uh, you know something is going up or down, uh, then obviously we wouldn't be doing a very good job for our LPs. So I primarily talk with institutional investors about where the world is going. So large pools of capital like pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and asset managers. Um, and I leave kind of our hedge funds to make the decisions on their own, which they do. They don't really need me because they're good at what they do. Yeah, and we're going to go into, into some of those thoughts here. I think the um, I, I want to go back to what you said a little bit earlier that you know the last decade hasn't been great for macro and you tied in volatility. 
to that. Now, I, the simplest answer is probably the right one. I'm going to assume that from your own research that the reason why macro didn't do that well the last decade is because there really wasn't that much left tail risk, with the exception of late 2018 and 2020. And it's very hard to beat the S&P when the S&P is the only game in town. Yeah, I mean, like risk parity kind of ended everything, you know, and uh, you just bought NASDAQ and you hedged it with bonds and you were good. You didn't need somebody charging you 220, you know, when, when everything kind of went in, in the single way. So correlations were very high between asset classes. Volatility was very low and systematic and passive like strategies I've performed. So just being active, not a hedge fund manager, just being an active investor was was a loser's game over the last decade for you know like for most people and so um that's why a lot of institutional investors have soured on the macro hedge fund space and a lot of defenders of macro have either retired or have just you know been run out of uh illiquid and private allocation seats in large pools of capital so it's become very very difficult to sell this product for example to you know, like a large swath of pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Um, we've continued to do it because we sit on a beach in Santa Monica, watch the ocean, surf, have fun in LA, and we're okay. We're okay chiseling the statue, you know, the bronze statue of David over a course of a decade. And if we just do 10 hedge funds, we just do 10 hedge funds. So, And so in a weird way, because we're so stubborn, and you could say, because we're so stupid, you know, we've, we've remained convinced that the macro, macro hedge funds have a role to play with large pools of capital. And I think one of the things that we've always said to the CIOs is like, look, maybe they'll underperform this decade. But when you pick up the phone and you call somebody running a macro hedge fund, they can inform other parts of your portfolio. So if something is happening in the commodity space in the middle of this, macro, you know, desert decade where nobody wants macro, but you have somebody who can explain to you why commodities are collapsing from 2011 when metal started, 2014, all starts collapsing. You can call your macro hedge fund CIO and, and, and have a conversation with them. So there's a value in allocating to them beyond just returns. Uh, but now that volatility is back, geopolitics is back, politics is back, I think the systematic guys and the quant the quant ones in, in particular are going to struggle with some of these, uh, you know, sudden, very human changes in the marketplace. And that's where the macro hedge funds should uh, perform. And they have been over the last several years. Yeah. And, you know, it, it is, um, it, it's, it's fascinating to me just from looking at it from a hindsight perspective. But, you know, since we're talking about a decade, I mean, really, I think where you can trace a lot of this to is the start of quantitative easing three. I mean, that's when a lot of the kind of smoothness of yeah. beta kicked in, when a lot of alpha basically just was very hard to, to grab. And it, it, it's, not, it's, it's not clear to me why is it that that iteration of Fed stimulus in particular created that dy dynamic. You didn't have that with Twist. You didn't have that with QE1, QE2. It was, it was the 20, uh, late 2012 one that really kind of sparked the, the death of active. Well, probably because it was unnecessary at, on, on some level. I think you could argue that that's why. And that... Uh, you know, the, the first iterations of QE were very much necessary given the situation at the time. Um, so there was still volatility. It didn't, it didn't pervert the markets. Uh, I think you could maybe argue that as we got later into the cycle, we were really just trying to prevent volatility and potentially prevent a dip back into a recession, which wouldn't have been tragic. You know, similar, and policymakers, like, they do this. They, fall, they, they become enamored with a tool. Uh, and then they use it for everything. I mean, you could argue that we're in the current predicament with inflation for very similar reasons. You know, the first, the first two large stimulus efforts, uh, fiscal stimulus efforts, you could argue probably were needed. But then, you know, you have a new administration coming in January 2021 wants to, uh, and wanted to put an imprint on the cycle and you had another fiscal package in early 2021, which probably was unnecessary and not needed. And so I, I would argue that that's why. But the underperformance of the macro space uh, convinced a lot of people that things are like done. They will never revert back to a single PM human active management. And I think that's just silly. This arrogance is bred by a decade of trend. You know, there was this arrogance that like, well, you, you don't need a human with experience to predict the markets. 
that you know that, that can't happen. Machines and computers will be better at that. And I think that that arrogance has caught a lot of allocators who don't know what they're talking about and don't have a historical perspective. You know, it's it's caught them with their pants down. Now that suddenly Xi Jinping or Donald Trump or Joe Biden or Vladimir Putin can say something, and the computer is going to be like, I don't know what that is. You know, it's it's not data driven, so I can't predict it. And that's where I think having allocation to macro is very important. If geopolitics is truly coming back and it's much more relevant for macroeconomics and for for markets, you can't just rely on on data driven systematic or quant strategies. Now the interesting thing about talking about the geopolitical end is to your point, it's it's you can argue hard to model because exactly like you said, there's no real sort of data, right? You've got to interpret words and try to figure out where the geopolitical uh, front is going. The thing is, if you were to just listen to the media, all geopolitical news seems to be negative and the world is ending and war is coming with China. And and I always go back to it's like, well, what do you do with that? And is that even a pure message? Because you never know what incentives there are on the back end, whether it's ratings or whatever it would be. So when you think about interpreting geopolitics and, and integrating that into a macro framework, how do you filter out the uh, the messaging, maybe having sort of a an improper phrasing of what actually may be happening behind the scenes? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, first and foremost, if you're an investor, the first thing to do with geopolitics is just forget about the fact that 99.9% of people in this industry think it's a risk. That would be like saying that technical analysis is a risk. You know what I mean? Like, technical analysis is not a risk. It's not an opportunity. It just is. It's a method. It's a tool. It's a framework. It's like saying valuations are a risk. Geopolitics is the same as technical analysis. It just is. It's a tool in your toolbox. And so sometimes it can be a tailwind and sometimes it can be a headwind. And of course, it depends on the asset class you're looking at. Uh, So that's the first issue. Have a risk neutral approach to politics and geopolitics. Now, what's interesting to me is that this is very difficult for people in finance to do especially on FinTwit, by the way. <laughs> and that's because most Maybe people... Everyone's an expert on FinTwit. What do you mean? They, they, everybody knows everything about everything. Well, yeah, but like, see, most people, when they approach finance, I think there's a level of objectivity because it's a numbers game and you're trying to make money fundamentally. Like, you're not in finance to, you know, change the world. Uh, I mean, some people are, but like, and God bless them. But like, look, the bottom line is lots of people have fiduciary responsibility to others, to themselves, to their families. We're all here to make money. So Apple versus ne- versus Netflix... You know, like it's not a tribal game. The problem with geopolitics is that people lose their goddamn mind <laughs> when it comes to politics and geopolitics. So they don't have this ability to be objective, neutral, and just approach it from the same perspective. You know, and this is this is really important because it leads folks to overemphasize their own biases and like what they think should happen. And that's because ever since, you know, you were 12 years old, you've been discussing politics. It seems easy. It seems um, familiar, uh, even to those who are not experts at actually analyzing it. So everyone has an opinion on who's going to win the Republican primary or who should re- win the Republican primary or whether inflation is bad for lower incomes or not. Like everyone has these kind of views and opinions. Um, and so they don't approach it in the same objective, scholarly framework driven manner as with, as with financial and economic issues and that's how they fall into pitfalls m- most often so that's that's the other thing i mean th- we need to professionalize within our own industry but also broadly we need to professionalize the epistemic community which is the geopolitical analysis it cannot be driven by biases now this is not the case in finance today most most investors whether they're big or small they subscribe to consultants who are most definitely biased. And they're biased because a lot of them come from former government officials, uh, former government intelligence agencies, military, and so on. And I know this because I work with the CIOs of largest pension funds and sovereign wealth funds in the world. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on consultants who were formerly in someone's cabinet. A lot of times, I would say 70 to 90% of the time, these people are reselling you PR. Like whether it's American propaganda, whether it's Australian propaganda, whether it's Chinese propaganda, they're just reselling you that stuff. And so you're sitting there and you're like, oh, wow, cool. This is such great analysis. This guy's a four-star general, invaded Iraq. Amazing. You know, and you're like, yeah, but like, you know, 
you're getting a perspective that's not actually objective. No, it's not, and, and, it so- and it sounds really convincing too, right? Because it's like they have the credibility; they've done all this stuff. That's right. And and listen, it's not like useless. You just need to know how to use it because what you're getting is a great window into how this particular country here, let's say the U.S., is going to think about the situation. But that's not the end all be all. You know, that's not going to decide whether the world goes that direction. Um, you know, and it's a very biased view. And I'll, I'll tell you a specific example. When the October 7th Commerce Department ruling came on semiconductors, um, these sort of, you know, past expiration date consultants, you know, who've basically been left on the shelf too long uh, after serving the government, they went around the world saying like, ooh, we, we hit China hard. They're going to retaliate. Um, the Chinese didn't retaliate at all to the October 7th ruling on semiconductors because it's actually not that tough. And because it's so specific and so focused on the most advanced semiconductors, um, the rest of the world, the Japanese and the Dutch, eventually came along after very hard-nosed negotiations, but they basically told the Americans, sure, we will not sell China these extremely sophisticated semiconductors and CapEx machines, but everything else, we're going to sell, sell it to them. And so the Chinese were okay with that. They were comfortable they came to terms with the fact they will never produce three and five nanometer chips inside China, but they're comfortable with that because they're going to come and dominate the 28 nanometer chips, which, by the way, are probably more important to military hardware. But, but just don't tell the generals in Pentagon because apparently they don't understand that. What am I getting at here? I'm getting at here that there was this very America-centric view of what was going to happen. And I think it came out of this very biased national perspective. Now, not all consultants are like this. There's some very, very, very good ones. I have a good friend, R.P. Eddy. He runs a consultancy uh, that does tap in former um, officials, and they tend to be extremely good at their job because they have a very wide network, for example. Um, so my, my point, though, is not that you shouldn't use former government officials. It's that you should use them by having your own framework. And that's where this material, materialistic dialectic comes in. You know, like, forget trying to get close to the decision makers. Treat them in an antagonistic fashion. Policymakers and politicians are not your friends. They're not people that you should be having a drink with in a Georgetown, you know, town home at a cocktail party. They are subjects of your analysis. They're mice in a laboratory. And so what you need to do is you need to figure out how to predict their behavior, not based on what they want, a mice in a laboratory, in a labyrinth, is not going to be able to run through walls. They're going to, they're going to go down the political path of least resistance. And that political path of least resistance is measurable. We can, as, as investors, we can think about what are the objective material constraints that are going to force somebody like Boris Johnson, who says he would rather be dead in a ditch than extend the timeline for Brexit negotiations as a good example. You know, what is going to force him to eat those words later? Or, you know, you have like Trotskyite Syriza come to power in, in Greece. And 12 months later, they're implementing the most Reagan Thatcher supply side reforms in the history of the Mediterranean. People who believe X and are hard committed zealots about X end up doing Y more often than you think. Why is that? Was well, because they're forced to do that. They're forced to do that by the material reality. So focus on the material reality, not on smoke and mirrors of rumor mills. Um, now, this is very difficult. Again, in our industry, this is very difficult to do. Most people have been reading The Economist since they were 12. You know, they, they've listened to their dad and mom argue about like some ideological issue. They've, they've been participating in these political debates. So they feel that this is like sports. Like, I can have an opinion about this, you know, like... <laughs> And it's no, this you should be as professionalized about political analysis as you are about looking at charts or trying to use, you know, systematic tools or data. You should be as objective and as professionalized and as clear sighted that this isn't voodoo. There's a way to predict behavior of policymakers based on fundamentals. Yeah, as you're talking, I kind of my mind goes to all the rhetoric around China, war with the US, uh, Taiwan, and I always um, find that these things that are being said probably don't even consider the fact that if China were to go into Taiwan and if the U.S. were to have a military conflict, it's like mutually assured economic destruction. 
which means nobody really has a true incentive to to do that, us and China. Am I off on that? And and if I'm off on that, um, what are some of the things that you, you're viewing from a geopolitical lens that you think investors should be mindful of? Well, I think, you know, when you say that, you're correct. The problem is that World War I started, World War II started, you know. These were also uh, very negative for for sort of economic well-being. So you do get economically suboptimal outcomes because of politics. And I would say that in the case of Taiwan, it would be a much worse economic impact on the world than we think. Taiwan really is at the center of the sophisticated supply chain for um, you know, consumer electronics and for not just semiconductors themselves, but also many, many of the products that you consume semiconductors on. Taiwan has a very sophisticated supply chain. It would be even worse than maybe people think. And yet, I don't think that's a constraint enough. I think the constraints right now are that the United States of America is struggling to convince its allies that China is a existential threat to the West. I would say that that's the number one constraint to the U.S. U.S. is kind of alone when it's facing down China. Australia is very much with the U.S., Japan is as well. But a lot of other major economies, even India, which has a threat from China, physical threat on its border, they're equivocating. They're, they're sort of sitting on the fence, if you will. Or as the Indian foreign minister said, don't say we're sitting on a fence. We're standing on our own interests. So we're not going to fall into your camp just because you ask us to. So that's the first. That's the problem for the U.S. It's kind of alone. And it's trying its best to convince the rest of the world that China should be contained. On the other hand, for China, I think the constraints are even greater, to be honest with you. I think uh, Chinese constraints are that Their dream of a consumption-led economy are dead for the rest of this decade. The C in the GDP equation of China is going to be uh, subpar for a very long time. And that's because, uh, not because of demographics, by the way, although yes, that too, but it's mainly because they just had a surge in credit over the last cycle, trying to, you know, replace the U.S. consumer that spent the last decade the leveraging, China leveraged their consumers in order to replace the Western consumer. And that has now, that bubble has kind of burst slowly. And, you know, I think the, the, the domestic consumer is going to deleverage for a very long time in China. Now, that might seem like a nerdy macroeconomic issue. Why, what does that have to do with geopolitics? Well, because China is addicted to exports. They're the main driver of growth for China and have been since the pandemic and will continue to be. So, it's, it's very dangerous for China to engage in aggressive military policy when its customers have that sword of Democles above their head. Um, so I would say that that's the number one risk for China. The other risk for China is that they still import a lot of commodities through various uh, choke points on the planet, whether it's Malacca Straits, whether it's Straits of Hormuz, and the U.S. Navy still controls those. So literally, the fifth fleet of the United States of America is securing China's oil supply. That's literally what's happening. If you're an American listening to this, some part of your tax dollars are basically going to make sure that China gets, you know, its oil safe. And (laughs) that's, that's a very vulnerable position for China. So I think that both sides are at this point constrained. What I would be watching for though, Michael, is how bad does the deleveraging of the, of the Chinese consumer get? How much economic pain will China get into over the next five years? Because if that pain gets severe, then yes, they may choose to pursue perhaps an economically suboptimal outcome because it's already so bad. You know, it's a typical rally around the flag effect that tends to happen in democracies, by the way. There's political science research that shows that democracies tend to rally around the flag through aggressive uh, military policy more often uh, than authoritarian regimes. But the thing with China is that you know, their, their citizens may not have a vote, but they are very active on social media and the internet. They are voicing their opinions. The government is listening. And those opinions, when it comes to foreign policy, are getting more and more nationalistic uh, by the minute. Speaking of uh, deleveraging constraints and credits, I think that's maybe a good transition to what's been going on the last you know, 24, 48 hours uh, with some of these uh, banks uh, and their stock performance. Now, again, admittedly, I've been traveling, I've been seeing this on the periphery, and as much as I was 
uh, all throughout February saying March, 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 because I thought this would be a volatile month. I didn't expect there to be necessarily suddenly the risk of a, a credit blowout, which may be starting. Who knows? It's only been a few days here. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts on um, constraints for the Federal Reserve. Uh, you, you have a lot of assets that, in truth, were not really marked to market or marked down among the banks. And nobody really knows sort of the health of the banks to begin with, given how unusual stocks and bonds behaved last year. You haven't had default risk premiums rising. And if you were to have some kind of credit event here, as much as I said the next move would be the Fed lowering rates, not hiking rates, it would look really optically bad. Speaking about constraints, optically bad if inflation is still at 6% and the Fed has to lower rates because the public's not going to understand the the idea that rates lag the economy. Yeah, so like, uh, yeah, the Fed definitely has a problem. I mean, first of all, the United States of America is the least interest rate sensitive economy probably in the world. You know, and I'm sure there's a bunch of bears like lighting themselves on fire right now. Guys, sorry, cool it, chill, but it's true. Doesn't matter how fast the Fed uh, funds rate went up. It's in real terms, it's still negative. Okay. First and foremost, second of all, hurdle rates for corporates are much higher than people think. So that's the rate at which, you know, a CEO may not be able to do any more capital investment. Uh, and finally, American consumers just couldn't care less. They just couldn't. And yes, everybody always pulls out the violin and starts playing a sad, sad violin song for the bottom 20%. But let's just be clear here. The other 80% of Americans in terms of income, they're sitting on a massive amount of deposits. Their home equity has gone through the roof. And their mortgage debt is set by 30-year, basically, um, on a 30-year time horizon. So they don't care. It's not like Canada where it resets every five years based on interest rates. So this is a very interest rate sensitive economy, which means that the Fed has had to go hard, you know, to to dent the strength of the economy. And that has caused all sorts of problems in the bond market. So you've seen, obviously, the long end start to sell off. And to your point, a lot of that has not been marked to market because you don't have to do it until you need it. If you're a bank, you really need to start selling your bonds when you're uh, when you have a problem with, uh, you know, the investments or the, the deposits that you've given out to a set of um, customers. And that's, I think, what's why I don't think this is a systemic problem. This is a problem in uh, for VC, for tech, for crypto. That's why the first two banks that blew up are crypto bank and obviously a bank that services you know VCs and, and their portfolio companies. I think this is uh, the carnage or pawnage, as I like to call it, in the tech community, beginning, which was mainly contained in public markets and public equities of tech companies and some uh, some privates as well, it's now kind of spreading to the their bankers. Uh, I don't think this is going to be a great financial crisis kind of an event, but you're right. You have the news today that Janet Yellen is starting to monitor bank, that trickle down, and I'm sure this is going to go back to the Fed. And even though they probably share my view, that this is the tech bros getting what they deserved. I think that they're going to worry that there is some 10 to 30% probability that it actually impacts the rest of the financial system. And that brings me to the point of your, what you said, which is 6% inflation. Like we're going down to somewhere around 4 to 5% CPI. And I think at that point, it becomes really a political issue, not a mathematical one. It's easy to be tough at 10% CPI. It's easy to channel your inner Paul Volcker, where everyone agrees that 10% CPI is too high. But what's happening now, Michael, and again, a lot of people don't want to hear this, and they'll say like, oh, Marco, you make too much money. You don't know how it feels for the little guy. Well, let's, let's talk about the little guy. Real wages are positive, particularly at low income levels, because that's the workers we need, for example, in the service industries. So nominal wage growth at lower income levels is much higher than the current level of CPI. And if CPI is going to 4 to 5%, as most economists think that it is, I, I do think that as well. I mean, we're not far from there. Real wages are going to go even further higher. So that's the first issue. Like consumers can withstand 4 to 5% CPI. Corporates can withstand 4 to 5% CPI because one, they can pass that on to consumers who have real positive wages. Two, their input costs have basically collapsed in half. And three, the nominal wages are actually coming down. And Michael, this is where this becomes like mana from heaven. It's like 
Tinkerbell has shown up and, and sprayed us all with magical pixie dust. When CPI starts coming down, you get weird things happen. Because nominal wages are coming down, but real wages are going up. In other words, if you're a CEO, you don't have to give the same raise you gave in 2022 in 2023. But your workers literally have more money to spend on your goods. So corporates are fine. The consumers are okay. And then finally, savers. Well, grandma must hate 4 to 5% CPI. She must still support Jay Powell, right? Wrong. Grandma hated the last cycle. Because grandma was sitting on fixed income, yielding nothing. Fed funds rate was zero. And so, yes, yeah, CPI was 1.5%. But what did that help grandma and grandpa who were sitting on fixed income? Nothing. It helped them nothing. CPI level by itself meant nothing if you were a coupon clipping, you know, baby boomer trying to live off of fixed income. Today, you've got CDs. Some credit unions are offering CDs over 12-month lockup for 6%. 6%. So if CPI gets to 4 to 5%, even savers will be fine. So what am I getting at? I'm not being normative. I'm not trying to tell you this is great. This is good. All I'm trying to say to you is j has got a problem. And it's not banks, man. It's not banks. It's the fact that once CPI goes from 10 to 5%, trying to convince Americans that 2, 4, 5, 6 million unemployed is good for the economy becomes really difficult. The number of political constituencies that care about CPI going from 5 to 2% is basically just the PhDs in economics and some denizens of the FinTwit community who, you know, go to sleep with gold bars and like crypto accounts or something. But nobody's going to care. I'm telling you this right now. If they cause a recession because they were trying to go from 4 to 2, like, you know, they're going to be tar and feathered, medieval style. And they know this, which is why they're probably going to come up with an excuse for why four to five percent, you know, well, we're we're on our way to two, we're fine. And by the way, in six months from now, I think they have a six month wi- window to prove me wrong. They have a six month window in which to be really tough, really tough on um, you know the markets and so on. And then you get to twelve month window before the general election. And I just don't believe that Jay Powell is going to have the guts to go hard ahead of the U.S. election because he will be interfering in the political process at that point. And I can tell you this, political science is not a science at all. There's nothing really scientific about it except the method. But it is an absolute law of physics that if there's a recession 12 months before an election, the incumbent president is going to lose. I mean, he's not going to lose to Donald Trump. He's going to lose to my chocolate Labrador. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, this is just like, you could run a Chinese spy as a Republican candidate, and they would beat Joe Biden if there's a recession 12 months before the election. And the Fed is going to know that. So I think that what's happening in the tech community and the banks could be used as an excuse. But the real excuse is that we're getting to a point on the CPI number where politically there's just no real urgency to bring it to two. In fairness, your I like your Labrador's tax policy policy views. In fairness, so I think you know that would make sense. That the Labrador would, win. but okay. So I want to go to the name of the space uh, before we wrap up in about seven minutes, um, so I can get ready for the next space here. The end of the world is the bull case. I, I use that term, you know, from October on because everyone was thinking the world was going to end, and it's like, all right, listen, if the bond market were to have kept on acting as volatile as it did back then, mortgage rates would have been like twenty percent by November. So you can't bet on that outcome because it's, it's the end of the world, the end of the financial system. So bet on stocks. That was kind of my whole melt-up argument back then. Um, I see a lot of bearishness now in uh, what's gone on the last 48 hours. And it does, I think, harken back to this is 2008. Everyone's automatically going back to that. You alluded to great financial crisis. I, 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 I'm sure you don't necessarily make very short-term calls on things. But I am curious if you see what's happening this week and you say to yourself, this is probably overblown and actually the bulls could reassert. I will say to everybody candidly, that's actually my view. I think March is going to be volatile up and down. I don't think this is the credit event. It might be, but it's not my base case. I agree with you. I think we are in a 2001 to 2009, 10, 11 cycle. And uh, in many ways, you know, uh, it's a CapEx driven cycle, commodity driven cycle. In 2001 to 2010, it was reindustrialization of China. This time, it is rewiring of supply chains. And so tech is getting killed. And what's happening with 
tech banks is just the cherry on the the top of the Sunday of an absolute tech pawnage. So I think stocks, you know, for the rest of this year, I don't think a recession is coming for a number of reasons I already articulated. U.S. consumers flush with cash, with deposits. They don't care about interest rates going up because their mortgages don't reset. So the U.S. consumer is going to be fine. That's your 70% of the economy. And I say this in a very glib way, but obviously I've written tens of thousands of words and hundreds of charts on this. So it's not like I don't think about this hard. U.S. consumer is going to be okay. We're going to avoid a recession this year. But stocks could go sideways. You know, Michael, so like S&P 500 X fangs could be up 20%. But because the U.S. index is so laden with tech stocks, it could just go flat for the rest of the year with some ups and downs. And uh, that would be my view on the short term. I don't think that what's happening now is necessarily, you know, terrible. All that's happening is what happened in the early 2000s when tech got killed, but there was a stealth bull market in everything non-tech. And I think we're going to have a very similar dynamic right now. So if you have tech exposure, private or public, get out. Do not bottom fish. I've been saying this for two years now. Tech is getting pawned, P-W-N-E-D. It's a gaming term. You know, look it up on Urban Dictionary. That's what's happening to tech. Now, that's a short term why I'm not, you know, necessarily bearish. I mean, obviously, it's, at some point, there will be a recession. But for me, this is a tech event. On a longer term horizon, I'm not bearish because I think that a multipolar global order competition between states we have empirical evidence from history. This has produced real, genuine technological innovation in the past. And for the past 20 years, we've had all this tech innovation, but it hasn't shown up in productivity data. You know why? Because it's not productivity enhancing, okay? Being able to get a date with an app and then have a cheeseburger at 3 a.m. when the date is over, like that's not going to improve your productivity. And a lot of, and obviously I'm being glib and I'm being like unfair, but a lot of this you know, SaaS-driven innovation has just kind of like improved our performance on the margins. We still produce food the way we did 50 years ago. We still transport ourselves the way we did 50 years ago. We still generate energy the way we did 50 years ago. And the outcomes are kind of obvious. Like we live less long in the United States of America than we did 20 years ago. Like, you know, can we just pause and reflect on that? So I think that what's going to happen over the next decade is true, genuine, hard technology innovation. And so you should be in industrials, materials, and energy. Those are the sectors you should be in. And that rotation out of tech is going to be volatile. It's going to be especially volatile in the US. And I think China too. Those are the two tech-laden markets. So I'm not really bearish. I'm just bearish on what worked the last decade. Yeah, and, and I'm with you, by the way. And, and it's funny because people are like, oh, what happened to your melt-up? It's like, okay, it, we're in a pre-election year. To your point, there's still a lot of cash. There's a lot of bearishness. You had the seventh worst year in history for stocks last year on a real return basis. It's like I go back to conditions, not calls. You have all those conditions are there for a surprise move higher. But it, again, it could be a very volatile melt up, which is sort of my. Well, my also, argument. also just one real okay. quick, Michael, if we avoid a recession, the biggest call this year is another bad year for bonds. And that's what's obviously happening. Correct. Yes, that's correct. Exactly right. You, you have to find exposure to commodities. And you know what's interesting? Yep. There are no more commodity managers out there. Like, I know five of them. I know personally five out of the six biggest commodity hedge funds in the world. Like, I, I can literally put them on one hand. So that's a good example, you know, of, of how difficult it is now to get exposure. If you're an allocator sitting in the Midwest on like 100 billion bucks, how are you going to do this yourself? You got to find external managers. And for many of these like emerging markets or commodities, yeah, it's, it's hard to find because many didn't survive. I've been telling my hedge fund team to start putting together a list of commodity managers in 2020. At the, at like when the oil went negative, I was like, we need a list. And everyone was like, why do we have holy oil is negative, bro? Like, what are you doing? I'm like, listen, it's turning. This is going to be a CapEx-driven cycle because of ESG, green tech, China, all this stuff. Uh, we, you know, like allocators are going to start demanding this. And I can tell you right now, without naming names, that list we put together is like the most sought-after list in the institutional world. Everybody wants that list because they need it. They know they need it. And the first question you ask is, what happens to China? 
I don't have I don't know what happens to retail investors who are trying to get exposure to emerging markets and then get put into China, but I can tell you on the institutional space, large pools of capital are already going through the providers of indices and they're asking them to produce for them an index that doesn't include China. So it's happening at a at a high level in high finance, whatever you want to call it. So I'm guessing yep. it's going to start happening for retail investors as well. Um, and by the way, you know, like if, if anybody wants to hear more of my thoughts on this uh, Silicon Valley Bank and just tech, I recently did um, a talk in Montgomery Summit. You can, uh, you can access it on my Twitter feed or go to YouTube or go to Montgomery Summit and you can watch like 30 minutes of me basically explaining and articulating my view of why I'm so bearish tech. It's not just about inflation or 10-year yield. It's also that it worked last decade. Nothing, wor- nothing lasts for more than a decade. No narrative, but it's more complicated than that. In a world full of nation states fighting each other and trying to get a leg up, we're just simply not going to allow trillions of dollars to go to VCs that effectively then give it to 23-year-old dudes hitting the bong and coding in Silicon Valley. Like That's just not going to happen. Louder, that money- <laughs> louder, louder. I'm so done with this nonsense. <laughs> no, I mean, listen, all this money... You know, it's going to have to go to 40-year-old, 50-year-old, kind of awkward socially engineers who tinker with materials and hard sciences. Like, that's where that money is going to go to. Um, Now, I'm not necessarily saying one is better or good, whatever. I don't really care. I'm just saying, like, look, we know what happens when the government gets, like, kind of involved in the economy again. A lot of it is not good, obviously. But mission-oriented goals are not bad. You know, it means government is just going to say, okay, what do we need to solve? We need to solve for faster computers or, you know, like less pollution, whatever it is. Here's money, go solve it. And actually, you'll be surprised by how often the private sector rises to the challenge of the public sector mission. And that happened with the vaccines. Like, let's just pause and reflect on Operation Warp Speed. You know, the Trump administration came in, had a meeting. Half of the table were regulators, half of the table were private companies. And they were like, okay, private companies, what do you need? And they said, we need different regulation and more money. Okay, cool. Now go get a vaccine. And we got a vaccine. But point of this is that you will see more of that. And I think that's fundamentally what's happening. And so I think a lot of people in finance are not focusing on the big picture. Tech is going to continue to get pawned, not because the tenure is like slightly higher. It's because the priorities of the planet and of people in charge, i.e. governments, are now to, towards hard technology and true genuine innovation. So if you're in the business of starting SaaS companies, be very careful. I think that's a uh, good place to wrap this Twitter space up. Again, everybody, please make sure you follow Marco Popix. This was a great conversation. Check out his book as well, available on Amazon. Thank you, Marco. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Marco.